Hello, and welcome to our webinar on court setting of Fran terms in the light of unwired planet. This follows on from our webinar last month when we discussed the approaches of the different national courts in Europe as on the question of whether and in what circumstances an injunction should be granted for infringement of a standard essential patent. My name is James Marshall from the Taylor Wessing London office, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by Dieter Kamler from Germany, Wim Mars from the Netherlands, and Chris Thornham, also from our London office. In April, in the case of Unwired Plants and Huawei, the English court settled the terms of a Fran license a decision that is re receiving considerable attention and, indeed, scrutiny. It is a long judgment which results from a very thorough investigation of the issues at trial. The judgment is an important contribution. We now have a much better idea of how, in future cases, the English court is likely to decide Fran terms. Today, we will be comparing the approach of the English court in Unwired Planet with those of the German and Dutch courts on these issues and analyze what can now be expected if parties seek court determination of Fran terms in Europe. We have divided today's agenda between us as follows. First, Following on from last month's webinar, we would like to update you on developments that have occurred since on the injunction question. There was a further hearing before the English court on the 19th of May, and judgment on that handed down last Wednesday. Chris will speak about that in a moment. I will then speak about one of our main topics of today, the methodology used by the UK Patents Court in arriving at a FRAND royalty rate. We will then move on to the question of territorial scope of the FRAND license. I will hand back to Chris, who will look at the UK guidance we have received from the Unwired Planet case as to uh, the court's approach. Dieter and Wim will then explain the respective positions in Germany and the Netherlands and contrast those uh, with the approach of Mr. Justice Burse in Unwired Planet. We will conclude the webinar with a short summary of the differences between the jurisdictions. The main part of the webinar should last a little under an hour. We would much welcome feedback and questions. There is a Q&A box in the corner of your screen. If you'd like to submit questions, please do so. Uh, and we will try to answer them in the time remaining at the end of the webinar, or if that is not possible, we will answer them as soon as possible after the webinar. Also, if you could spare a minute at the end of the webinar to complete the survey, that most valuable feedback would be greatly appreciated. I will now hand over to Chris, who will report briefly on last week's judgment in the UK. Thank you, James. Just moving the slide on. So, uh, as James mentioned, uh, we had the 5th of April main judgment on non-technical issues. Um, just to explain, at that time, uh, Mr. Justice Burse had decided that a worldwide set portfolio license was planned. He had said at that point that a final injunction should be granted. However, it wasn't granted that day on handing down the 5th April judgment. A separate post-judgment hearing on the 19th of May was arranged for the parties to make submissions on the form of order. Between 5th of April and the 19th of May, um, there was time for the parties to finalise the terms of a worldwide set portfolio licence, taking into account the decision um, that Mr Justice Burst made in the main judgment. The form of that worldwide licence was finalised a few weeks after the main judgment in April, and uh, it's referred to by Mr Justice Burst as the settled licence. 
he took the unusual step of annexing that settle license to his decision on the 19th of May hearing. So after the 19th of May, he handed down that 7th of June decision and, uh, and annexed that settle license. So let's, let's have a look at what was um, uh, discussed uh, on the 19th of May. First thing uh, addressed was undertakings or an injunction. Harway intended to appeal the main judgment the 5th of April. It put forward undertakings to the effect that it would, within seven days of final determination of the appeal, enter into the settled license that had been determined, or, in effect, give such other licenses as may be determined on appeal. Harway said, in light of those undertakings, um, yeah, an injunction wasn't necessary. Well, th there was a question whether those undertakings were watertight, uh, um, yeah, by meaning by that um, it might depend on the outcome of points on appeal. However, Mr. Justice Burst found that he didn't need to decide that. He said, um, at paragraph 26 of his uh, 7th June decision, the claimant, in this case Unwide Planet, had been forced to come to court to vindicate its claim. An offering of, under, of an undertaking after judgment is usually regarded as made too late. In general, the courts will order the injunction and, and refuse to accept such belated undertakings. So, the judge decided there should be a final injunction, although he stayed it pending appeal. The form of the injunction was modified to include also a proviso that it would cease to have effect if Huawei to enter into the FRAND license terms determined by the court. Uh, he called that a FRAND injunction. Note, the injunction only runs in the UK, but of course it does encourage resolution worldwide. Uh, a second issue was damages. Um, this is, uh, 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 can be dealt with quite quickly. If a license wasn't entered into, then um, uh, an order um, damages needed to be determined uh, in the UK. Mr Justice therefore made an order for damages, but it would cease to have effect if the settled license was entered into and damages um, uh, were ordered to be stayed pending the appeal. The third issue was a declaration uh, relating to FRAND. Different forms of declaration uh, were tabled by the parties, which could then potentially be the focus of appeal. But Mr Justice Burst was only prepared to make a specific declaration, and I've set it out there um, on the slide. Um, the point there is that the license annexed to the judgment represents the FRAND terms applicable between the parties in the relevant circumstances. The fourth point was permission to appeal, and I've listed out uh, aspects that were the subject of uh, permission to appeal. Um, these were all ordered, whether more uh, than one set of terms can be framed. Um, you, you may recall from our last webinar that uh, the court had determined that there is one set of terms that are frowned, uh, and the issue is whether or not that's correct. Uh, secondly, whether the court ought to have held that a UK only license is frowned. This was a contention of Huawei, who had been willing to take a UK only license, but uh, a worldwide license had been ordered. Um, a further point about whether the court should determine frowned terms for territories outside the UK, uh, that goes hand in hand really with the second point. And then uh, a point about so-called hard-edge non-discrimination, which is something that uh, James will address. The final point is application of the Huawei and ZTE principles uh, and whether the, the judge had erred at all in that. So w with that summary, I'll now hand back to uh, James, who will explain the approach to Fran royalty determination, followed by Mr Justice Burst and his judgment on the 5th of April. Thank you very much, Chris. This slide encapsulates the rates found by the judge to be the 
friend royalty rates in a, in a worldwide license. It is the end result of his lengthy and thorough judgment. Uh, it will be seen that the rate is different as between the so-called major markets on the one hand and China and other markets on the other. There are two reasons for this. First, on the basis of the comparable licenses in evidence, the judge accepted that rates are generally lower in China than the rest of the world. The relative factor varied between the licenses, but the judge found that a friend license would be such that there should be a reduction for China of 50%. The second point was that on the facts, the unwired planet portfolio was smaller in China than elsewhere, and this led to a further reduction in the royalty rate. The rate for China in the Fran license was extended to a number of other markets. The judge held that outside China, a Fran approach would be to divide the rest of the world into major markets and other markets by reference to the number of standard essential patents in force. As can be seen from the table, he treated the three standards, 2G, 3G, and 4G, individually. In separating major markets from un other markets, he set a threshold number of SEPs for a particular standard. If the number of SEPs for that standard equaled or was above the threshold, the country would be considered a major market. If the number of SEPs in that country was below the threshold, it became a so-called other market. And thus, sales in that country carried a lower royalty. It was thus possible that a country could go from being a major market to an other market if relevant SEPs were found to be valid or not essential by a relevant court. If the effect of that was that the total fell below the threshold. To reach this end point, the judge first determined what he called the so-called benchmark rate, which was considered to re reflect the value of the patentee's portfolio, and then he adjusted that benchmark rate to take account of variations in patent coverage ac across relevant countries so as to derive the rate set out on this slide. The judge considered the benchmark rate to be fair, reasonable, and generally non-discriminatory. It, it does not vary depending on the size of the licensee. Small new entrants are entitled to their royalty based on the same benchmark as established large entities. The benchmark rate will eliminate both hold up and hold out. I will discuss a little later uh, what was referred to as the hard-edged component of the non-discrimination limb of the Fran commitment, and whether that justifies a licensee demanding a lower rate than the benchmark, because, the lower, because of that lower rate had in fact previously been agreed with another similarly situated licensee. So how did the judge determine the so-called benchmark rates? Broadly speaking, two possible approaches were canvassed in the course of argument and in the judgment. First, there was the so-called top-down approach, which starts with a number representing what the appropriate total aggregate royalty burden should be for a given standard, and from that, seek to share out the royalty across all licensors in proportion to the value of each licensor's respective patent portfolio. The other approach was to use so-called comparable licenses, namely licenses which have in fact already been entered into. The judge in this case primarily adopted the comparables approach and used the top-down approach merely as a cross-check at the end. The use of comparables in determining notional royalty rates is of course an exercise with which the court is very familiar in the context of damages calculations. It's well established that the object is to find the closest possible parallel license. If there is an, if there is an exact parallel license, 
there is no point in looking any further. If there are slight differences, allowances are made. But once a comparable has been found, it's not right to modify uh, the royalty rate in that license by reference to other cases which are not truly comparable at all. The effect in the analysis of a true comparable should not be diluted, to use the words of the judge, should not be diluted by a consideration of other less relevant licensees, uh, licenses. Although the comparable's approach is clear in principle, its application is of course fact specific. Much depends on the nature and indeed the detailed terms entered into by the particular patentee or, or perhaps another patentee in what may be said to be the closest parallel or parallels. Naturally, there is plenty of scope for dispute, as there were, was in this case, as to which license or licenses are the most appropriate comparables and which are not. Quite naturally, parties will take the position that best suits their case. But it is reasonable now to expect the English court to adopt the comparables approach in future cases. The other general point to make at this stage, and this will always be a significant practical issue in FRAN determinations in the UK, concerns disclosure, or what we used to call discovery, and confidentiality. There will almost inevitably have to be the provision of potentially relevant licenses potential comp comparables in either party's possession as part of the usual English discovery process. If there are potentially a considerable num number of licenses in the, in the possession of one or other or both parties, then the court will have to control the level of disclosure, restricting the number of licenses disclosed to a manageable number by using some appropriate criterion. The burden is increased in this context because of the highly confidential nature of the existing licenses and the fact that, that the licenses represent confidential information not only belonging to parties to the case, but also to counterparties to the various licenses who are not parties to the proceedings. All of this can and will readily be accommodated by the court using so-called confidentiality clubs or confidentiality rings. In this particular area, the English court has proved sympathetic to the disclosure of licenses on confidential terms restricted to outside counsel and independent experts and subject to a right to object to a particular expert. This is all a well-trodden path in English litigation. Although the comparables approach will be fact specific, there are one or two quite interesting aspects that arose on the Unwired Planet case. Unwired Planet had already entered into a license with Samsung. At first blush, it might be thought that that was the most reliable comparable. However, due to the circumstances under which that license was negotiated, the judge held that it was not so. Now, this was because it arose from the acquisition of Unwired Planet by another company at the time, as the judge described it, when Unwired Planet was in financial trouble, uh, and by then the only other license that Unwired Planet was able to agree was with Lenovo. The judge said that by late 2015, uh, Unwired Planet was close to insolvency. That was his um, assessment of the evidence. Moreover, the company that purchased Unwired Planet was found to gain more from entering into the license with Samsung than pure royalties in terms of a wider race relationship and building trust with Samsung. As it turned out, the judge placed much greater weight on the various licenses that were in evidence entered into by Ericsson. Although the judge evidently considered each of these licenses carefully in turn, much of the reasoning has been redacted from the public judgment. From that, the judge needed to derive a proportionate share of the value of the Unwired Planet patents as a proportion of the value of the overall Ericsson portfolio. In this way, 
he derived the so-called benchmark royalty rate for unwired planet for 4G multimode, 3G multimode, and 2G handsets as well, um, as well as 4G, 3G, and 2G infrastructure. As indicated earlier, um, by way of cross-check, he then applied these benchmark rates to see what total royalty burden that would give, assuming a figure for the value of the unwired planet portfolio as a proportion of the total number of relevant standard essential patents for the particular standard, that is, the total number owned by all patentees. The figures for the total royalty burden applying his derived benchmark royalty for Unwired Planet and his derived share of the total essential patents was 8.8% for LTE, for example, slightly higher than the specific numbers stated by various patent holders in 2008. But in his view, that was not so far as to be out of line. In determining the relative values, that is the relative value of the unwired planet portfolio to Ericsson's portfolio and, and to the total number of relevant standard essential patents, the judge accepted that a patent counting exercise was inevitable. Moreover, he considered that the counting method used had to take into account the issue of over-declaration. On the facts, although Huawei and Unwired Planet were largely in agreement as to the number of Unwired Planet patents that can be regarded as truly essential to the different standards, rather than simply declared as such, there was a significant difference a significant disagreement about the total number of SEPs for the particular standards, in other words, the denominator. A detailed analysis had been performed on the patents from each patent family in the Unwired, port, unwired Planet portfolio by an independent expert. The judge found on the evidence that Unwired Planet had six truly essential LTE handset patent families and seven truly essential LTE infrastructure patent families, essential to mandatory parts of the standards. For UMTS, the figures were one handset and two infrastructure. For 2G, two handset, one infrastructure. So that was all a result of a careful analysis by a technical expert of individual patents in the unwired planet portfolio. Because of the sheer numbers of patents declared essential by all patentees to the standards, rather different ways of estimating the total of truly essential patents had to be used. Unwired Planet and Huawei used different methodology to derive their total numbers. Not surprisingly, Unwired Planet was much smaller than Huawei's, thus meaning that Unwired Planet's share was larger, a larger share of the total than was contended for by Huawei. For instance, for LTE, the rival figures for truly essential patent families were 1,812, that was Huawei, versus 355, which was Unwired Planet. Each side, of course, criticized the detail of the other's methodology, uh, but in the end, the judge resolved the question by deciding that the appropriate figure was 800, somewhere in between the two. The judge performed a similar exercise for 2G and 3G. So having arrived at a benchmark rate for the different standards, both for handsets and for infra infrastructure, the judge then modified those to derive the appropriate rate for a worldwide license. As I say, dividing up the territory between, on the one hand, major markets and, on the other, other markets, and adjusting the royalty rate where appropriate uh, to deal with unevenness in patent coverage. Therefore, an important aspect of the judgment um, in this detail means it is now considerably easier to make reasonable est estimates as to the likely royalty rates that an English court may apply to other portfolios in future cases. 
Before passing back to Chris on the territorial scope of the license, I will just deal with the, the interesting point that arose concerning the non-discrimination limb of FRAND. That is, whether the pa potential licensee can demand the same rate as the patentee had previously agreed with another licensee in a similar position. This is what was referred to as the so this is what was referred to as the hard-edged discrimination point. It arose on the facts specifically as a result of the 2016 Unwired Planet Samsung license that I referred to a moment ago. Huawei took the position that they were entitled to the evidently much lower rate of that license. After a careful re review of non-discrimination case law, the judge concluded that the FRAND undertaking should not be interpreted to introduce that kind of hard-edged non-discrimination obligation. But even if he was wrong on that, he concluded that such a hard-edged discrimination obligation would only apply if there was, in fact, distortion of competition as between the two licensees. He pointed out that competition law does not seek to prohibit different prices being charged to different customers. An important aspect of competition law is that only terms which are sufficiently dissimilar to distort competition are prohibited. Therefore, in conclusion, the, the true interpretation of the Frand undertaking in the judge's view from the point of view of non-discrimination is that a benchmark rate should be derived which is applicable to all licensees seeking the same kind of license. In other words, it is general non-discrimination. Even if, contrary to his view, the FRAND undertaking also includes a specific non-discrimination obligation of the type contended for by Huawei in relation to the Samsung license, then that obligation only applies if the difference between the benchmark rate and the existing license with the lower rate would distort competition between the two licensees. On the facts, the judge held that although the relative difference in royalty rates was large, uh, to be considered in the context of possible distortion of competition, they should be considered relative to the margins on the relevant products. Expressed that way, the differences were very small percentage, percentages. Hence, on the facts, he concluded there was, in fact, no tendency to distort the com competitive relationship between Huawei and Samsung. In the event, contrary to his principal view, that Huawei was only entitled to a license derived from the benchmark rate. Sorry, let me say that again. Hence, there's no dis the tendency to distort the com competitive relationship between ha Huawei and Samsung uh, if Huawei was only entitled to a license derived from the benchmark rate. With that, I will now hand back to Chris, who will explain in more detail why in the Unwired Planet case, Mr. Justice Burst concluded that a worldwide license was FRAND, whereas a UK-only license was not. Thank you, James. Just move to the next slide. So I'm going to address uh, the territory of the FRAND license, worldwide or national. Uh, just to uh, explain. Huawei um, at the outset had said it uh, was uh, willing to take a UK only patent by patent license but during the course of the litigation had uh, accepted that it would take a UK only portfolio license. Um, it, it was not prepared to take a worldwide license. Unwide Planet wished to, uh, wished to grant a worldwide license and contended they were entitled to insist on it. Uh, they did offer a UK-only uh, portfolio license, but uh, the, the judge concluded that the worldwide license was the appropriate one. So wh why did he do that, and do we expect that to be a likely result in future cases? Uh, while we made a number of points on the facts, uh, the first one that I think is important to address is that uh, while we said that it made a very large number of sales in some other countries such as South, and, uh, and regions such as South America and 
Southeast Asia, where Unwired Planet had no patent coverage at all for 2G and 3G, apparently. Now, Unwired Planet countered that, uh, quite aside from a, uh, uh, a license for sale, a license was required from manufacturer anyway, irrespective of the point of sale. Uh, and so, even with no patents in some territories, that didn't uh, remove the obligation for a license. Other points were made that if there were only a UK license, one would still have to account for unlicensed, imp unlicensed imports coming into the UK. Uh, this is cumbersome, clearly. And if you have many national licenses, each having to monitor imports of unlicensed products, you'd also need some kind of uh, offset uh, or netting off between the different national licenses. It would become even more cumbersome. The judge concluded that Unwired Planet's portfolio uh, today is sufficiently large and has sufficiently wide geographical coverage that a, a licensor and licensee acting reasonably and on a willing basis would agree on a worldwide license. He even said that such parties would regard country-by-country -country licensing as madness, the worldwide license being far more efficient than for example, country by country. He did accept that uh, worldwide license could have different rates for different territories, as, as, uh, as James has addressed. The ju judge also observed that although there are, were some licenses in, in the case where a particular territory, such as China, was carved out, the vast majority of existing licenses had been, that have been produced in the case were truly worldwide. So, with that, um, well, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, another line of argument which relates to bundling. Uh, the question was put whether Unwired Planet insisting on a worldwide license um, amounted to unlawful bundling or tying of a patent license in one country with a patent license in another. This was rejected by the judge. He held that given the prevalence of worldwide licenses and the prevalence of assessment based on patent families, and I underline that, families, um, so today the normal practice is not just to look patent by patent, but at families. Uh, one, one couldn't say um, that uh, uh, you could assume tying he certainly wasn't prepared to assume that the tying of a set license in one country to a set license in another has by its nature a competitive foreclosing effect. So although one can't assume that tying has um, a competitive foreclosure effect, uh, a close analysis of the actual uh, effects would be required, and, and that hadn't been done. Looking forward, I think in future cases, world, worldwide licenses may be the starting point with two qualifications that I've listed there in the, uh, the slide. First one would need to look at the size and geographical, geographical coverage of the portfolio. And uh, on the unlawful bundling arguments, uh, they may be uh, revisited uh, potentially by other litigants if there is proper evidence about the actual effects of uh, um, tying a set license in one country to a set license in another, but it would require proper evidence. Uh, I'll now hand over to um, Dieter, uh, who will explain the approach of the German courts. Thank you, Chris. I will now give you an overview of the situation in Germany and how German courts tackled the issues which were discussed in the Unwired Planet against Huawei case. As you may know, the case law in the higher courts in Germany is still rather limited. We do not yet have a published fully recent French judgment from a higher court. The most detailed decision is the guidance order of the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal in Siswell and higher. This guidance order of November 2016 now resulted in a final judgment on April 4, which is not yet published due to confidentiality issues. 
However, it is publicly known from the announcement of the judgment that the court dismissed Siswell's motion for an injunction because of discrimination of hire compared to other licensees of Siswell. The Karlsruhe Court of Appeal so far only issued an interim order suspending an injunction granted by the first instance court in Mannheim because Mannheim did not review the patentee's initial offer in detail, which is required under Huawei ZTE. So the following statements will be mainly based on the Sisrel and Hire decision of the Dusseldorf Court of Appeal. So from the Dusseldorf guidance order, as well as other decisions we know that the German courts approach the friend issue fundamentally differently compared to the unwired planet decision. The German courts will not actively engage in royalty setting. They will only review the royalty rates proposed by the parties. Simply asking the court to set a fair royalty with an undertaking to accept whatever the court decides is not an option in Germany. The outcome of the court's review will always be a yes-no answer. If the patentee's initial offer is not friend, the injunction will be dismissed. If the patentee's offer is friend and the defendant counteroffer is not, the injunction will be granted. What happens if both offers are friend is an open issue, but we expect the injunction might be granted. Motions directed at obtaining additional guidance from the court with regard to the friend royalty, for example, by moving for a declaratory judgment on friend issues, are difficult to make under German procedural law. Unlike the High Court and Unwired Planet decided, in the German court's view, the friend commitment merely confirms the patentee's compliance with obligations under Article 102 TFEU. It is not a commitment to do anything beyond the legal requirements and specifically not a commitment to apply certain license terms. This view was again confirmed by the Dusseldorf Court of Appeal in Sisville and higher. <clears throat> the fair and reasonable in friend therefore merely defines a range of conditions which are in compliance with Article 102 TFEU. The court will accept any proposal that is within this range and in case of disputes, the patentee's offer, if it is friend in the range, will prevail over the, a defendant's counteroffer. The patentee's discretion to select the terms of the license also applies to other legal terms as long as they are not abusive. Terms which are common in the industry will generally be accepted by the court. For example, the licensing of a portfolio of several patents essential to the same standard on a worldwide basis was consistently accepted by German court. These worldwide portfolio licenses have consistently been accepted since the decision Orange Book in 2009, and any attempts by defendants to limit the license offer to just one patent or one country have been rejected. When it comes to the calculation of the royalty rates, German courts are rather reluctant to adopt a top-down approach since it's very difficult to define the fair overall royalty burden for a product. However, according to the Dusseldorf Court of Appeal, a course allowing for an adjustment of the royalty rate as a safeguard against inadequate royalty stacking may be appropriate in a friend license agreement. Other portfolios may be useful as comparables, provided these portfolios are actually comparable in size and technical value. Whether this is the case needs to be explained and proven by the plaintiff if the plaintiff wants to rely on such royalty rates of other portfolio as justification of its own royalty rate. With the difficulties of the top-down approach or the comparison with other portfolios, the focus in recent German cases is very much on the comparison of the patent's friend offer uh, with the plaintiff's prior licenses. This is in fact a review for discrimination. According to Düsseldorf, the plaintiff has to prove the absence of discrimination. Relevant prior licenses with third parties have to be disclosed to the court and to the defendant. In camera proceedings where the parties themselves have no access to the evidence, as suggested in Unwired Planet by the High Court, are not available in Germany. Rather, defendants will get access to the patentee's prior licenses if they sign an NDA with a contractual penalty in case of a breach. 
when prior licenses with third parties are reviewed, the standard is whether conditions uh, of those prior licenses are comparable. The defendant cannot request completely identical terms compared to the prior licenses. Small differences in royalty rates are not relevant. However, if the differences are significant, the plaintiff will have to justify the differences by providing and proving substantial reasons for the different treatment. <clears throat> According to the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal, licenses concluded by prior owners of the patent portfolio are also relevant if they are still in force. These licenses will have to be produced in court by the plaintiff. Still, in a previous unwired planet decision in first instance in Dusseldorf, a moderate increase in royalty rates in case of a change of patent ownership was accepted, provided it does not distort competition. This seems in line with the High Court's approach, uh, approach to discrimination in the unwired planet decision. Dusseldorf further remarked that selective enforcement of the patents can also amount to discrimination. <clears throat> the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal in Cicel and Higher also provided guidance on some specific aspects of the royalty setting. According to the court, royalty payments for invalid or non-essential patents have to be avoided. Since the portfolio patents will not be re fully reviewed in the initial trial, an adjustment of the royalty rate must be possible if patents are later found to be invalid or not infringed. The court left it open whether restricting the license offered to a relatively short term of, for example, three years, might be an alternative because it enables a timely renegotiation of the terms. Moreover, a front license offer must avoid royalty payments for exhausted patents. For example, no royalty should be due if components coming from a licensed supplier lead to patent exhaustion. Whether this is the case has to be assessed under the law in the market for which exhaustion is pleaded. At last, the Düsseldorf Court of Appeal indicated that a reduced rail royalty rate for markets in which only very few of the licensed patents are in force may be appropriate. This is in line with the High Court's unwired planet decision where reduced rail royalty rates were applied in these so-called other markets. With this brief overview of the front litigation in Germany, I will now hand over to Wim, who will explain the court's approach in the Netherlands. Thank you, Dieter. In the Netherlands, we have had only one case after the Huawei judgment of the CGEU. That is the case of Argos against Philips of 8th of February 2017. Uh, although uh, we expect to receive more detailed judgment on FRIEND within the next couple of months. Once you take into account that the Argos Phillips case was filed by Argos in response to separate infringement proceedings filed by Phillips relating to three SEPs for the UMTS standard. Argos asked the court to declare that the Phillips offer was not FRIEND and that their own offer by the way, about a factor 10 apart from one another, was friend. It was therefore not a typical friend case in which the patentee claimed for an injunction and in which the defendant raised a friend defense to try and prevent the injunction. The regime as set out by the ECJ and the Huawei ruling was therefore not directly applicable. The court did, however, rule on some very interesting points. It gave some more guidance on substance of specific friend terms, such as whether a patentee may insist on a worldwide license. Answer is yes. Can a patentee <clears throat> demand a higher royalty in case the royalty is paid too late? Again, the answer is yes. And whether a patentee may offer UMTS and LTE as a package deal for the same royalty rate, even when its stake in LTE was not that significant. Also, the answer is yes. And we will look into this in a bit more detail with the following slides. First of all, the Dutch court, unlike the UK court, <clears throat> will most probably not send a friend rate. In view of the Dutch court, friend is a range, a bandwidth. Uh, and that means that more royalty rates will be regarded to fall within this range. Therefore, the court will accept any reasonable royalty determination, and the patentee has a wide discretion setting the royalty. 
from the Argos Phillips case, it shows that the Dutch court adopt a similar approach as the German courts. That also means that the patentee offer will prevail as being friend, even when the defendant also puts forward a friend counter offer. The Dutch court has also given wide discretion to the patentee to set legal terms. I already mentioned that the court does not regard a worldwide license as not being friend. Uh, in other words, a worldwide license is friend. And this is in line with, I think, both the German and the UK court. Offering a package deal license for UMTS and LTE was also not regarded as abusive. The court held that the technical similarity between the two standards is a justification to offer a package deal applying the same rate to both of the standards, even when the Philips stake in the total LTE portfolio was not that significant. And finally, the Dutch court also had no problems with a clause which triggers a higher royalty payment in case of non-compliance. Although the court explicitly assessed these legal terms on friendness, it also stated several times that it was up to Argos, in this case, to try and negotiate the specific legal terms of which, of which they feel that they were not friend. And by not doing so during the negotiations, Argos, so to say, forfeited the right to later claim that these terms were not friend during the proceedings. In other words, Argos should have negotiated all the terms which they were not happy with. The court spent a lot of time on the different calculation methods of the royalty. The Dutch court is of the opinion that the best valuation method would be to look for the closest substitute uh, available for free or cheaper, which is not in the standard, and then to assess what the additional technical and economical value of, this, of the SEP would be in comparison to this substituted technology. But since Argos did not substantiate this method with evidence, which I think is also really, really difficult, uh, the court uh, did not do anything with it. Uh, but it said that this is the best calculation method. Uh, it only assessed that the other calculation methods, such as the top-down approach based on patent counting and the total royalty burden for handset, as put forward by Argos, is not suitable to derive the real value of the Philips apps. The Dutch court does seem to accept that other comparable portfolios are useful to assess the value of the portfolios. However, Argos did not put forward any comparables and did not claim an order that Philips should submit its comparable licenses. Therefore, there is not much guidance to gain from this case on the topics of comparables. The German and UK courts are much more el elaborate on identifying the importance of comparables. But I expect that the personal note that this will evolve in analysis as well. Yeah, we arri arrived at the, the final slide of this webinar. Uh, during this presentation, James, Chris, Dieter, and I already highlighted the most apparent differences in the approaches of the UK, German, and Dutch court. Uh, and in this slide, you will see a summary of these more, um, more important differences. There are more differences in, in approach. They are really subtle, uh, but they were not uh, really crystallized yet. So this is a summary of the, the most important differences. The first big difference is that the German and Dutch court hold the view that friend is a range and are therefore not willing to set a royalty rate, while the UK court does not see any objection to set a friend royalty. That's a big difference. I, I also think, again, on a personal note, that the difference in procedural law uh, also play a part. Uh, a second big difference uh, uh, of a second um, important topic to mention is that the UK, German, and Dutch courts acknowledge the importance of comparables, but the UK and German, uh, German courts are much more elaborate on that. 
the German and Dutch courts are reluctant to accept a top-down approach as decisive to set a friend rate. But the UK court uses the top-down approach as a cross-check, but also uses as a first method the comparables. Um, the last differences, uh, or sorry, the last topic, which is pretty much the same in all the countries, is the UK, German, and Dutch court all accept that a world war, worldwide license offer can be friend. Uh, from the uh, Chris's presentation, you know that there are some qualifications, but in general, uh, they uh, they all accept that a worldwide license can be friend. The UK court goes further and rules that the UK only license was not friend. Yeah, that, that concludes our webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for your questions.